Well then, Bunny. Yes. This week, this week we are uh, discussing a trend. Uh huh. A big trend in the world of cinema. 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 <laughs> this week we are watching the latest in a long line of biopics, biopics mm-hmm. based on bad movies. Hollywood has recently become obsessed. With a wave and onslaught of big budget Hollywood films based on legendarily bad movies. Who could forget Daniel Day Lewis and his mm-hmm. portrayal of the giant bird, the Cacanya, in his behind the scenes film, The Giant Claw Artist? Uh huh. That film deserved all of the Oscars that it won. It really did. And now let's talk about breakthrough cinema. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was so happy because that year Hollywood released 35 Holocaust films. Yeah. But for the first time ever, Hollywood's like, no. No awards for you. We finally realized this, this is just a cheap ploy to get statues. Mm-hmm. No. Instead, we're giving it to Daniel Day Lewis and his portrayal of the giant bird, Takakanya. <laughs> or what about Brad Pitt's touching, tender portrayal of the manservant Torgo in the biopic Behind the Manos? Behind the Manos. I cried so hard mm-hmm. in the theater that day. I still, I still cry every time I watch that film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and then, yeah, the and the movie that killed him. Yep. Mm-hmm. Then there's the probably the most well known bad movie biopic, Sesame Street's Big Bird, starring in the Birdemic Artist. <laughs> now here's where it gets complicated because Bunny, the future is now Mm -hmm. meaning that presently bunny presently we are in the future of the past yes yeah we are currently in what we consider the present but the present is the future of the past in the past we wondered what would happen in the future and that is now yes so the future is now even though it's the present to us, we are in the future because the present is the future of the past. But soon, eventually, mm-hmm. uh, by the way, soon, eventually, verbal copyright, the Pope on Film Podcast, 2008, all rights reserved. Soon, eventually, our current present, which is the past's future, soon, the past's future, which is the present, will be the past for the future. Yes. I created a Venn diagram to explain this all to you, but it disappeared in a puff of logic. (laughs) Soon, the past's future, which is the present, will be the future's past. Stick with me here, everybody. So, what bad movie biopics will they be making in 10, 20, 30 years from now? Hmm. Summer 2032. Jaden Smith is Goofy Toofy. <laughs> he he would, you know, that's who I would cast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This year on Digital Rectal Download, watch the <laughs> film that was nominated for 18 Academy Awards. It's the making of the worst film of all time. Croc of Ages. Croc of Ages. <laughs> the making of Croc of Ages. Yeah. But let's leave the future to the future and focus on the present, which is the past, future, and the future's past. Yes. With the 2017 Tommy Wiseau biopic ishness known as The Disaster Artist. Yes. Now, Bunny. Uh huh. Let's talk about the Oscars. Okay. The Oscars were nominated 
uh, just a few days ago. And um, usually the, the, the Golden Globes aren't a perfect 100% accurate look at things to come in the world of the Oscars. Usually it's the Screen Guild, the Screen Actors Guild Awards. That's usually like the better uh, look at what is going to happen in the yeah. Oscars. But they announced the 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 Oscar nominations and the disaster artist, as far as I can tell, this week's movie uh-huh. has been nominated for only one Oscar. Really? Which one? Best Adapted Screenplay. Okay, because that makes sense. Okay? That makes sense because I knew it was up for things, and I thought it would be like, you know, best picture, best actor, and shit like this. And I was like, that really can't be possible. This cannot be an Academy Award winning movie because, as it turns out, I like this. Yeah, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. It was up for all of those things in the Golden Globes. Uh huh. It was up for best picture. It was up for best actor, and fucking uh, James Franco won best actor. Really? It, at the Golden Globes, James Franco won best actor. He brought up Greg, Sis- the actual Greg Sisteros, and the actual Tommy Wiseau up, and Tommy Wiseau being Tommy Wiseau tried to grab the microphone from James Franco and James Franco <laughs> kind of brushed him aside. Yeah. And everybody in the audience is like, oh, because that's kind of a dick move on James Franco. And then for like the for like three days after that, everyone is like, oh, my God, James Franco pushing off the guy who he played in the movie that he just won an award for. That's kind of a dick move. I can't believe James Franco would be a dick like that. Yeah. And then there's interviews with Tommy Wiseau about his take and what he was going to say in the in the in the in the in, the, in his speech. <clears throat> and then articles about, oh, dude, now we've contacted James Franco and he says this. And so that was like three days after the Golden Globes. But then that disappeared because a different sort of article started appearing. And the article was, a, hey, while everyone's talking about James Franco, maybe it's n- now a good time to look at the multiple sexual harassment allegations. <laughs> Because this dude is really creepy and perverted, and he's been doing some messed up stuff. Maybe now's the time to talk about it. Now wait a second. Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. Which one? <laughs> uh, freaking James Franco. James Franco. Okay. James Franco. So, I, I got um, confused. Because, yes, I've heard some things about James Franco before. Yeah, yeah. So now we're going to talk about Chris Benoit. Okay. I came up with this about a, a few hours ago. Because I was I was talking to Natasha, I was so upset about the Golden Globes and the Oscars, and and people were saying, "Oh man, uh, uh, for the last year, people have been saying, oh, the Disaster Artist, Oscar buzz. This could he could win best act, he could win a Best Actor Oscar. This could be up for Best Picture. This really could sweep. This is an amazing film. This is this this could really sweep the Oscars. And then it was nominated for a bunch of things at the Golden Globes, and then sexual harassment allegations came along, and now it's up for basically nothing in oh. the Oscar. And that really upset me, and I was trying to explain to Natasha why, and, and, and Natasha understood, and I'm like, I understand the Me Too movement, and I understand <laughs> feminism, and I understand that we need to believe these women who are accusing him of this, but just because he may or may not, but probably did, do horrible things, that doesn't mean he has lost his talent. No. And I was trying to explain how that is, and that's when it hit me. Chris Benoit is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. That's going a bit far, I think, but yeah, he was good. He was a, Okay, 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 well then let me, let me uh, clarify that. Chris Benoit was one of the greatest technical wrestlers of all time. Okay. Was he a great wrestler? No, but he can make you submit in like five fucking seconds. <laughs> He's one of those type of wrestlers. Yeah. Is he great on the mic? No, but he was an amazing, he was an amazing guy with the technical aspect of professional wrestling. He was probably one of the great 
technical wrestlers of all time. But the WWE has literally erased him. He has been erased. Really? Yeah. He doesn't exist anymore. Oh. And it upsets me because it's like, yes, he killed his wife and child. Yes. And I'm not saying that that's good, but the whether or not, but the fact that he killed people, yeah, does not take away his talent. No, I I, 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 I have to agree. So I just wish that we lived in a society that understood that, mm. you know. Yeah, because, without always having to go overboard on everything. Yeah, it's it's really weird that. James Franco won an award for best actor and then was not even nominated a month later. Yeah. That upsets me. You know? And it's all because of the the allegations? Yeah, pretty much. Huh. Because it, and and here's another thing. Uh a few years ago, uh, people people rallied against the Oscars, and there was the Oscar So White campaign. And I'm like, hey, and people were like, hey, hey, have any of you people in Hollywood noticed that literally no black people are nominated for any Oscars this year? That's fucked up. Yeah. This can't happen, and it needs to change. And there was a, a campaign, and they, it was hashtag Oscars, Oscars So White, and it hurt the Oscars so much that the Oscars said, oh, we have heard your complaints, and now there's going to be sweeping changes. We're getting rid of so many people. We're adding so many black people. And, hey, is that a movie? Was it done by black people? You have been nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> and so literally the next year there were so many black people nominated, and it was like, okay, but you're kind of going too far now. Yeah. And this is also kind of racist. Uh-huh. Sometimes you can be too unracist, which is in itself a form of racism. And so it's like, I don't know, I think the Oscars are trying too hard. And then this year they're like, okay, so now we've, we've, we've nominated all of these movies. And uh, Jordan Peele released, this year released the movie Get Out. And it's a really good movie, and I really, really like it, and it uh -huh. has a lot to say. But it's a horror movie, and the Oscars never do that. Yeah. I just feel that if Get Out was done by a white person, it wouldn't have been nominated. But Get Out was done by uh, Fat Key and Peel. Yeah. I, so yeah, I, I haven't seen it, so I don't, I don't think I could really it's, say. It's, it's really good. It's a really good movie. But I'm just not sure if it's. I was I I it, I was going to compare it to an Oscar award winning film, but the first thing that came to my mind was Driving Miss Daisy. Okay. And I'm like, oh, that movie sucks. That's that's like a natural reaction, though. Yeah. But the Oscars are trying too hard now, so it's like, okay, here's all these women. We've nominated all these women. Great. Let's nominate all of these uh, African Americans. Great. Let's nominate uh, some uh, some Mexicans too. Let's nominate some Mexicans. Great. We're, it's, so we haven't offended anybody, right? We can't offend anyone. We're the Oscars. Mm -hmm. So some allegations have come up for James Franco, and they're all creepy and horrible. And so now he's just been erased. And there's something about that that upsets me. Uh huh. Uh. He won an award for Best Actor, and now he's not even nominated. Yeah. They're, they're, that, there's just something a bit off about that. And frankly, especially since it was a good fucking performance. Yeah. So, Bunny, yes. right off the bat, what are, your, what are your thoughts on this movie? I really fucking liked it, and I was surprised surprised that I liked it, especially since it got off. And I think it was, like, intentional, but it intentionally got off on the wrong foot with me by just totally kissing Tommy Weasel's ass in the first, what, 10, 15 minutes, give or take, you yeah. know? Uh, yeah. But then getting further into it, they really didn't pull my pull any punches with them. They showed him for the dick he was. Oh, they did. Yeah. They did. 
fun. So I posted on Facebook. I, I said, hey, does anybody – hey, does anybody know how I feel about the – does anybody – want to know how does anybody know i just saw the disaster artist do you know how i feel about it please tell me because i have no idea (laughs) so then a friend of mine who i used to work with in california uh chimed in with uh i have some thoughts if you'd like to. oh yes i do want to hear those yeah. I'm like, hey, yes, I would like to hear your thoughts. I, I, as far as I can tell right now, I think I was entertained by it, but I also feel that it's a very expensive fan film. That was my first impression with it. So so this is I, what, Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. So this is what my friend Jesse had to say. It was my job to show the room to people every month at a cinema in Oakland. Midnight shows the whole thing. So I've seen it a bunch, and I've talked about it a bunch, and I've experienced it in a few different ways. And that is what is great about the room, our experiences and interpretations of it. The Disaster okay. Artist explains the room in a way that kind of robs it of that magic. In other words... The disaster artist gives the definitive answer on how and why this movie got made, which robs the creativity away from those who experience it. My The Room is different from you and your friends The Room, and that is special. I do think the disaster artist comes from a place of love, but it's James Franco and Seth Rogen's, and to a different extent, Greg Sestero's The Room. They just happen to have a budget and power to, to put their version of The Room on the big screen. What makes me a little bummed out is that uh, people are watching The Disaster Artist and I then either watching The Room after or just skipping it since they already know the story. Yeah. The magic of The Room, or a lot of outsider art, frankly, is what the viewer fills in on their own the late night conversations of what the fuck was that or the fan theories of the other or the utter bizarreness of the choices made in making the room that is what makes one reevaluate art itself um and it's invaluable invaluable the disaster artist defines it almost objectively which is the worst thing you can do to a wonder like this for us, my uh, uh, I'm I'm feeling kind of speechless by the the level of bullshit in that. For us, my coworkers and I at the theater, we watched it for the first time when we got the film prints. Just seven of us laughing our asses off in a big empty auditorium, especially refreshing after one too many historical biopics. Our theater's bread and butter. At one point, Nicole had wondered if she had spliced the reels in the wrong order because the pacing was so bizarre. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, Tommy totally loves Red Bull. He made us get them for him all the time. Uh, Red Bull. So I understand that. Why Why don't you just pee in my mouth, Red Bull? I understand that in the sense that I would I would probably feel the same way that he does with the disaster artist if someone made a big budget version of the making of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah. Like part of the magic of the Rocky Horror Picture Show is watching this film and going, what the fuck were they thinking? Like, did they mean for this to be bad? Did they mean for there to be so many spaces that people would be yelling shit at the theater? Did they mean for all of this to happen? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I have no idea. So then for like some rando ass person to just come along and finally Timothy Busfield's film that answers all of the questions about the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I'm like, oh shit, I'm not going to see this. Because part of it is just not knowing. Yeah. So if you make it so that this is the 100% story of this, then okay, well, that kind of makes the Rocky Horror Picture Show suck a little bit. Yeah, I can see your point. Like, I can kind of understand where he's coming from. I... 
in that I, sense, I, I can see a certain defense in saying that the room is art. Uh, in fact, while I was watching the disaster artist, I was really thinking how much I want to see a Tommy Weasel Crispin Glover team up. Oh, yeah, that would be fucking awesome. Um, yeah. I, I'm I'm really having a problem with the whole reevaluating art part of it. Yeah. No, this is a bad movie. Yeah. It has um, heart, but it's a it's a bad movie. It's terribly written. It's terribly acted. Yeah. The so, actors in the Disaster Artist did a much better job of acting, which I always find hysterical. How how when you get actors to act as actors how they will generally do a much better performance than the original actor yeah like every time i see uh julie landau and ed wood that's exactly what i fucking think it's like the the performance in bride of the monster was not this good (laughs) yeah so so with uh my friend jesse's statement in mind I love The Room, and part of the reason why I love The Room is because of the way that I first saw The Room. Yeah. So, when when you're a bad movie lover and a bad movie historian, like I consider myself to be, then any time society deems a movie bad, yeah. suddenly... Everyone is up your ass about it. Oh, you like bad movies. You like bad movies. Have you seen Blank? What? Yeah. You haven't seen Blank yet? I Oh, you got to see Blank. And it's like, okay. No, I'll totally watch The Room. Yeah, too. but if somebody so, tells me Human Centipede, I'm fucking flattening them. Fucking human. I really like the first Human Centipede because, the I don't know, there's something about it that's kind of subtle. Especially when you see the human centipede two and three where they go out of their way to be like gross. And then it's like, okay, the first one was not this probably because they didn't have a budget and they were trying to get like their foot in the door. Yeah. And then they went overboard with the second one and the third one. So, but the first one is, it's like this weird, bizarre creature. Yeah. But see, but what annoys me is, is that, that's what the first one was supposed to be. And that's what yeah. they, that's, that is the slant that they were taking on it for all its publicity and everything else, that it's this ass to mouth thing, you yeah. know? And, and you, now you don't pay out. You don't pay out yeah. on the film. So, so fuck that film, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I can understand why they would be going so much more gross in the next movies, but that's what you were supposed to do in the first fucking movie. Eleanor, Eleanor, put the pineapples back, Eleanor. Uh, Eleanor. Oh, 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 Isabella, when you're a superhero, there's all kinds of secrets that could kill. So, so I stayed away from the room for a very long time. Yeah. Because everyone said I had to watch it. I had to watch it. What would you say then? <laughs> so I stayed away from the room for a, like, a very long time. And then finally, like, I downloaded a, I, I downloaded a copy of it. And then I, I put it, like, on a flash drive. And I connected it to the TV. And then it stayed there for, like, a year. Yeah. Like, I owned it for a year without watching it, because that's how pissed off I was. Everyone was saying I had to watch it, and that just made me not want to watch it. That's just who I am. Yeah. About certain things. So then, um, at this period in time, Natasha and I were fighting like fucking crazy. Yeah. We weren't talking to each other. We were pissed at each other. There was, like, breakup in the air. Yeah. We absolutely hated each other. Tooth and nail. We weren't speaking at all. We were pissed. She said hurtful things. I said hurtful things. And now there's there there's just this angry, bitter silence in the air. And so like we would we were together to take care of the kids, but we just hated each other yeah. as individuals. And so she was sitting on the couch knitting, and I sat right next to her 
And uh, I started reading and I was hoping that we would talk, but she wasn't talking to me first. And I wasn't I sure as hell wasn't going to talk to her first. And so we sat there in silence for like a half hour. Yeah, because we were so upset with each other that like, oh, I'm not going to talk first. Well, why should I talk to you? So eventually I realized I've been sitting here in silence in spite and anger for like a half hour. I'm not just going to sit here all night in silence getting pissed at this woman. Fuck that. I'm going to do something. I don't know what. Fuck it. I'm going to watch The Room. (laughs) So I like I turned it on out of spite, you know? Yeah. Fuck it, Tasha. I'm going to I'm going to do something. I don't know what I'm going to do. Fuck. I'll finally watch The Room. What the hell? Might as well do it now. Fuck. So I just I I stand up without talking. I walk over to the TV without talking. I turn it on without talking. I sit down and start watching it, and I'm just like, oh, f- fuck Natasha! I'm so fucking pissed at her. I can't believe she would do that to me. I can't believe that. To... Wait, what the fuck am I watching? And then eventually, <laughs> eventually, I just forgot that I hated Natasha because that's how bad this fucking movie is. Yeah. You know, and this movie is so bad that I'm just sitting there watching this film going, God, I can't believe Natasha would even... Wait, is that a framed picture of spoons? (laughs) Why would they even... That's just bad filmmaking. Like, did he mean to have spoons there? I'm so confused. (laughs) So then... So then, like, the movie is so bad... That, like, 15 minutes into it, Natasha, who hasn't talked to me for, like, hours, finally says something to me. The first thing she said to me in hours, and it's, what the fuck are you watching, Steve? (laughs) And I'm like, is this movie everyone said I had to watch because it was so horrible, but I had no clue the depth. Yes. It's called The Room. And it's by this weird guy, and I'm not sure. He sounds like he sounds like a gay French Doctor Doom. I'm so confused. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what this movie is, or who this guy is, or how old he is, or what the hell's happening to his face. But but yeah, this is a really bad movie, and the movie was so bad that by the end of the film. We're like holding each other. <laughs> nice. Natasha and I. By the end of the movie, we're like like she's laying on me, cuddling me, and we're both best friends because this movie is so fucking bad that it brought us together. Nice. It was like that song, uh, uh Breakfast at Tiffany's. And it's it's it was a one hit wonder about a couple that's breaking up, but then the chorus is what about breakfast at Tiffany's? And 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 she said we both kind of liked it. And I said that's the one thing we got. Yeah. And that was that was it. And and it, like we hate each other, but God, that movie sucked, right? <laughs> the movie was so bad that it brought us together, and we were best friends. Talking about how bad the movie we just watched was, like it, it's cheesy. Yeah. But the room brought us together. That is you know? a good thing. And that's a that's good my, story. Yeah, and that's my The Room, and it's different from everyone else's The Room. And now I'm obsessed with The Room. It's one of the, the most heavily quoted movies in this house. Oh, hi, Bella. <laughs> I did not hit her. It's bullshit. I did not throw a water bottle. Yeah. Oh, hi, Danny. What I found fi- kind of funny about this movie, uh, 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 especially at the end, I mean, I don't think this is a spoiler at all, uh, but at the end when they were doing the side-by-sides, yes, you know, like how yeah. fucking spot on all of these actors were, except James Franco, really. You know, if you if you saw if you saw a side by side, that was kind of like, and not that it really should have to be exactly you know, frame by frame in the same 
but if anybody was not able to do it, it was James Franco. Yeah. I I I uh I marked out a little bit wrestler style when I saw that um that Nathan for you was in this movie. Who the fuck is that? Um Nathan Fielder? Fielder or Fieldman? No, Fielder. Nathan Fielder. He's like this awkward uh nerdy guy. He was the one guy who wears glasses and is a nerd in yeah. the room. And uh, he's had a show for a number of, of seasons on Comedy Central where he tries to help failing businesses. In the first episode, he gets in contact with a yogurt store that is having trouble. This it, It's the first story that they do in the first episode of the first season of Nathan For You. And it's a good example of things to come. So it's a failing yogurt store, and they're desperate to have people into the store. So Nathan has the idea, like, well, any any bad publicity is good publicity. So here's my idea. What if you uh, create a new yogurt flavor called shit? Okay. So uh, the the yogurt guy is like, well, I, and it's honest. He th- these are actual people. These are actual people, actual companies. And the person who owns the yogurt store is like, well, um, I would think that's a horrible idea, but also I'm kind of desperate for customers. So I guess, I mean, if you think it's right, and there's cameras, so I, I guess. So so the guy gets human shit and takes it to a. Um, to like scientists and they create a flavor and they make a yogurt that tastes like human shit and they put it in the yogurt uh, store and suddenly the yogurt store is packed. Of course, because people are going to want to try the shit flavored yogurt. No, why the fuck would you? (laughs) Yeah, and that's horrible. And so I need something else to wash off this horrible taste. So the yogurt store gets huge. That's basically every episode of Nathan for you. It's an actual guy with vaguely bad ideas trying to help uh, uh, companies. There's one episode where like he's raising money for like a Jewish defense fund by creating a series, uh, a, a clothing line that's loosely based on a, uh, on Nazi uniforms. Okay. And it's a horrible idea in poor taste, but people rush to buy these outfits because they know that, yeah, I don't want to buy these Nazi jackets, but all of the money is going towards this Jewish defense league. So yeah, I guess I'll go and buy these Nazi jackets. <laughs> But the most uh, the most uh, f- the most famous thing that he did was uh, like season three or season four. There was a coffee company and it was failing. So he decided to test the limits of parody and fair use by completely transforming this tiny failed L- Los Angeles coffee company into a company called Dumb Starbucks. Really? Okay. I like that. Yeah, it was on the fucking news. Yeah. Like in Shawnee. Like everywhere. Because there were lines like around the block and around the other blocks. Like there were there were like mile long lines for people to get into dumb Starbucks. Oh, man. Hi, welcome to dumb Starbucks. Do you want some dumb coffee? There's also a selection of dumb CDs of dumb foreign music that you can buy. <laughs> and people loved that. And they were, like, super successful for, like, four days until Starbucks closed them down. Ooh. Hiss. Hiss. Boo. Yeah. But I was watching this movie, and I'm like, holy shit, that's Nathan for you. And he was perfect in that role. He was perfect as the one guy with glasses. Yes. Who almost gets thrown off of the roof. hmm He was perfect. Everybody, everybody was perfect. Is that how he was credited, dumb guy with glasses? No, I, I just don't remember his name. The only person whose name I remember is Chris R. Chris R. Yeah, and Denny. That's all I remember. 
Poor but Danny. I really did like this film. It's funny and it's great fodder for a room obsessive like me. So I liked it, but I was worried that someone who is not obsessed with a framed portrait of a spoon yes. would not like this movie. Which is why Bella watched it with me. And again, she's never seen The Room before. All she's done is heard quotes for like the last 12 years of her life. So Bella saw it and she liked it too. Ah, okay. So it was a very well-liked film and I was really happy about that. That being said, I have three problems with this movie. Eleanor, you have you want to say something about the movie too? What do you think about the movie? Nah. No? Okay. I have three problems with the movie. Okay. 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 Number one. It gives no freaking information on Tommy freaking we saw. <laughs> no, it doesn't. In fact, I said it, most it brings of the film, it up. I spend most of I spent most of this film screaming at the character of Greg. Yeah. It's like, oh my god, you're just moving to LA. You are way too trusting. <laughs> yeah, I know. You need to be asking more questions. And fr- and frankly, like the homoerotica was thick. Yeah, yeah. In this, so yeah, yeah I- I'm definitely asking more questions here. Not one, do you think? Hey, maybe I need to ask more questions about this guy I'm going to be living with. <laughs> yes, I know. And by the end, you get no real answers. That really pissed me off. Yeah. So that was number one. So now part B. Yes, James Franco is good in this movie. I'm not saying that he's not good. He's pretty good. He's pretty good in this movie. Uh, And his relationship with Greg is very good. But here's here's, here's the kicker. Here's the thing. I don't think any of this is acting. Because you've got to realize that the person who plays Greg is James Franco's brother, yes. Dave Franco. So he's not really acting. It's just that they're fucking brothers. <laughs> I, so I, I, yeah. I don't know if James Franco is actually acting throughout this entire film. Because they have this great relationship. But then again, I'm pretty sure the Francos have this relationship. So they're not really, he's not really fucking acting at all. You know, like when Greg and Tommy are fighting in the park, it's like, oh, yeah, this is an amazing scene. But also, this is probably just the Franco brothers just fighting it out. This is like so much. I felt that so much of Greg and Tommy's relationship is just uh, fucking the Francos. Yeah, I guess. So that's uh, I, yeah, yeah. I I, I you know? got to agree with you there. Yeah. Like I don't think that this film would be as good if it was James Franco and just some other actor. Yeah. And especially, I think I think James Franco is probably really pissed Ooh. off that his brother got the Tom Cruise smile. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. it's it, it's it's upsetting. It, it, it's a bit upsetting to me that. <laughs> what, Eleanor? What? I I don't know what you want. Uh, do you want booby? Do you want me to give you booby? Here, here, here. Breastfeed from daddy. Will <laughs> will that help? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want the other one? Okay, here's the other one. There you go. Now are you going to sleep? Go night night. Shh. Lay down. There you go. So uh, so there's number one, and then there's part B, and finally, exhibit Q. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, but I know that they showed Tommy Wiseau as being a, a notoriously shitty guy on the set, and he was treating people like crap and and stuff, but. I still feel that they that this whole movie is um, 
getting a notoriously self-centered asshole and, and turning him into an Ed Wood-like underdog. I felt that, that this film yeah. still way too much credit. Like, uh, I'm sorry, but Tommy Wiseau is not an Ed Wood, and he doesn't deserve this movie. No. No, I, I, I'll agree with that. Yeah, no. That he is said, far from Ed Wood, and no, he doesn't yeah. really deserve a movie of his own. Yeah. That being said, I had a lot of fun with this goddamn movie. And you know what surprised me? What? The one thing that actually surprised me and made me, like, scream, Eleanor, 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 don't. That's going to fall on you. Stop. Stop. Jesus, that is a heavy safe. That almost fell on your head. You need to leave this alone. This is mommy's, okay? God damn. No, don't grab a pill bottle. You're really making me look bad here. <laughs> the one thing that really surprised me was that, okay, they finally start filming the movie, and here's Chris R., who is like the, the drug dealer guy with the gun. Yeah. Who's demanding money. And uh, that's like the first scene that they shoot. And then you don't see the guy again. And then at the premiere, you see Chris R. And it's fucking uh, a beautiful uh, uh, pretty boy and former uh, Disney actor, Zac Efron. Okay. And uh, Nathan, for you, is like, were you in this movie? Yeah, I played Chris R. Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't recognize you without the hat. But yeah, it was <laughs> Zach Efron the whole time, and and I'm I'm sitting there and I'm looking at Natasha. And I'm like, really? Was that Zach Efron cussing and holding a gun in the beginning of the movie? I had no clue. <laughs> He's like, yeah, we're gonna have to watch this movie again to see if that's actually Zach Efron in the beginning of the film. Jeannie has just walked in. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Yes, it was. Hey, uh, this is perfect timing because that's all I've got for the movie. Um, I don't really have terribly much either. I mean, I, 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 I was glad that I enjoyed it as much as I did because I really didn't think I was yeah. gonna walk it in. Yeah, I didn't think I would. I didn't think I was gonna be. I was gonna like this film either. But no, it was, it was pretty damn good. Yeah. I I I liked the acting. I thought the acting was really pretty good in it. Uh, yeah. I think he did a really good Tommy Wiseau. Yeah. I, but I, I but I do understand that. Man, we shouldn't be making this fucking guy this important. Yeah. He's he's yeah. just not. He's such an ass. Yeah. So, so, so that is it for this week's movie. I have an idea for next week. Okay. It's a Netflix movie, and it is set to premiere in about five hours. Okay. It's the new movie by um by um the director of Wet Hot American Summer. Okay. And former uh, 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 member of MTV's The State. I, I thought that for next week we could stay in the world of biopics with the new Netflix film, A Futile and Stupid Gesture. A the story few... of the making of the National Lampoon. Okay. Yeah. I read a wonderful... It, it's really great because it has like it, the creation of the National Lampoon magazine, then the National Lampoon radio show, then the making of Animal House and Caddyshack, and it, it features uh, a, a bunch of famous people in it. So there's a John Belushi, there's a Gilda Radner. And the thing that I'm really excited about seeing this is that the man who was the star of Community, Jeff Winger, plays Chevy Chase in this film. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and, uh, right, I remember and you mentioning actually, it. And he actually called Chevy Chase. 
and and Chevy Chase said, "Oh, so they're making a movie about that guy. I remember working with him. He is amazing, and he really never got his due for what he did for the world of comedy. So I'm really happy they're making a movie about him. Who are you playing?" And 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 he and Joe McHale said, "Well, I'm actually playing you." And then there was silence, and then Chevy Chase laughs. Yeah. And I'm like, that's the closest you're going to get to a blessing. Yeah. From frickin' Chevy Chase. So I'm excited to see this movie because, uh, number one, it's National Lampoon. And number two, Community. And number three, it's either going to be really good or fucking horrible. There's like, I don't think there's an in-between for this. No, I'm completely down here. Uh, That sounds like fun. Yeah. So next week, let me let me uh, let me see here. Where is next week? Okay, so next week we're going to be talking about one of my favorite porn stars. Okay, who's that? Uh, Melissa Ashley. Melissa Ashley. Okay, my favorite porn star back in the day. Uh, we've got a very exciting episode of Notes from the Bookstore. For homework, we're learning about the history of margarine. Uh huh. And also, I'd like to touch upon that period in time when Fabio was riding a roller coaster and he was hit in the face with a bird. <laughs> yes. Think that that's in the article, but I'm just gonna be touching upon that because it's one of the greatest moments of American history. Yes, it is. When the world's most beautiful man was. Hit in the face with the beak of a goose. <laughs> in the <laughs> like it, non-ironically, <laughs> the pinpoint acts of God. Yeah, this one is a real big fat fucking billboard. Yes, yes, a wing neon billboard saying "Eat at Joe's" over and over again. And and why don't Christians bring that up? I mean. Why don't why don't they bring that up? Because really, Fabio getting hit in the face with a swan on a roller coaster is some yeah, pretty fucking good proof of a god. Yeah, and he starts the roller coaster all happy and waving at reporters, and then the roller coaster happens, and then the roller coaster pulls back into the like dock like three minutes later, and the world's most beautiful man is covered in blood. (laughs) It's like, damn, it's been three minutes. What the hell happened on this fucking roller coaster? Yeah. (laughs) So that is next week. And next week we will be talking about the new Netflix film, A Futile and Stupid Gesture. This should be really good because, man, that last Netflix movie we did was wonderful. Why, yes, it was. Man, if anybody ever wanted to see two hours of Will Smith being really racist, yeah, then that's your movie. Mm-hmm. Like, like there's, like, I imagine stand-up comedians in that universe being like, you ever notice? How humans are always walking like this, yeah. but then orcs, but then orcs are walking like this. Yeah. Into an orc mall. <laughs> you notice the type of stores they got in an orc mall. <laughs> like that stand-up comedy in this Netflix world. So that's going to be next week. So next week's going to be really, really good. And I've been doing this thing lately that I'm really proud of in the podcast. I think I can say this because it's the end of the show. Okay. Where, um, where, like, I'm not sure what I should write. Huh, what should I write? I'm not sure what I should write. You know what I'm going to do? Just start writing. Okay, that's good. And, and then the words will take me somewhere. Yeah. And so that's why I'm always testing out stuff with the family. I'm like, oh, my God. You got to read this thing I wrote because I had no idea I was writing it. (laughs) Hey, honey, apparently I can write really detailed descriptions of sex with B. Arthur (laughs) uh, uh, of Betty White. Yes. Do you want to read about my insanely detailed look at being pegged by Betty White? Because that's a thing, apparently. Uh Uh-huh. So anyway, uh, that's next week. Next week's going to be a good episode. But now... Looking back. 
Looking back. Looking back at, at this episode, man, so much. We had a game. Mm-hmm. We had 9-11. We had uh, a toddler Jesus killing people. I think that this has been a pretty good episode. This has been a good episode and educational. Very educational. Yes. Yeah. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Steve saying thanks for listening. And for Eleanor and Maxwell and Natasha and everybody else, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you do just waffles and then booby touch. Do 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 Eleanor, you want to say bye bye? Say bye bye, Bunny. It took so much. Bye. Bye.